Hi everyone, it's Rax. We reached an incredible milestone on YouTube. We reached 100,000 subscribers. It actually happened a few weeks ago. I wanted to make this video a long time ago, um, but I had to move and a bunch of stuff. But finally, we're in my new apartment, which I'm very happy about. I'm back home in Nebraska. And like we've done with some of the other milestones that we've hit on YouTube, um, I've usually liked to give you a personal video about me. Before we did 30 songs on the guitar, and then we did 50 questions where you could ask me whatever you wanted. And I, and I thought today, pretty much as personal as it gets, I could tell you my life story about how I got here, how I became a video game player. Um, I'll go through the good, the bad, and the ugly. So there will be a lot of video game stuff in this video, um, but it's pretty much just going to be my story if you care to listen to it. If you don't want to listen to that video, I wouldn't blame you. Um, but actually, at the end, it looks like we have a package here from YouTube. I have not opened it. Um, I've had it for a while, but I wanted to open it with you guys because I feel like um, this is a, an achievement that we all did and something that I never thought that I would do, as I'm going to explain to you right here. So I just, I just scribbled these down in paint. I know how much you guys love my paintings. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to tell my story from these 13 chapters, kind of pave the way for you and explain to you uh, how we got here. So let's start with the very first one and with rough start. So I was born in Texas, and uh, as the title suggests, I had a, I had a pretty rough start. Um, I, was, I was pretty messed up. Um, I had a ruptured eardrum and it got infected. It made me very, very sick. Um, I had fevers all the time. I was throwing up. We'll get to that in a second. Um, that was my first major problem. Couldn't see well at all. I don't know if I was legally blind or not. Couldn't see well at all. Obviously couldn't hear well because my eardrum was ruptured. Um, I couldn't eat anything. Um, I, my stomach was completely intolerant to pretty much all kinds of food, and I entered this vicious cycle where I would wake up crying because I was hungry. My mom would try to feed me the best formula that she could, and then I would kind of writhe in pain because my stomach couldn't digest the formula, so it was, I wanted to eat so badly but I couldn't digest it. So what would eventually happen is I would throw it up violently and then I would cry. I would cry because I just threw up and then I would cry so hard that I would fall asleep. But I would only fall asleep for 20 minutes because then I would wake up 20 minutes later crying because I didn't eat anything and I was hungry. And you can imagine if there are any parents out there, I'm not a parent, but you can imagine what kind of hell that would put you in, right? So um, I was pretty much like the, the worst child I could ever be for my mom because I was so sick and my mom just so desperately wanted to help me, but nothing would help me. Sadly enough, that wasn't the worst of my problems. Um, the doctors found out that I couldn't breathe very well. And so they came out into the, into the hospital room and said, uh, we have some very bad news for you. We need to test your son for cystic fibrosis. And I don't know if you know what that is, but that is a, a deadly, deadly uh, lung disease. I think you're able to survive it nowadays a little bit, and they can treat it a little bit well. I'm sure someone in the chat will have had either had it or know somebody who had it, but they thought I had cystic fibrosis. So between cystic fibrosis, I can't see, I can't hear, I got a ruptured eardrum, I have a constant fever, and I can't eat anything, um, I was in extremely bad shape, had a bunch of surgeries on my ear. They finally found like one soy formula that I could possibly keep down. Um, had to wear very, very severe glasses. I don't wear anything now. I don't wear contacts or glasses or anything. My right eye actually really can't see anything. My left eye is like superhuman. It does all the work for me. Um, but I had a, I had a terrible, terrible start to life. And the doctor said, they thought if I had been born maybe even 10 years earlier that I, I would have died. So um, then we enter the recovery and the training phase. So um, when I went home, 
I was just so happy, as I understand it, I was very young, but I was just so happy to be home. I was so happy to be somewhat healthy. You know, if, if you lose your health, then you've got nothing. So once I had that, um, I felt amazing. My dad was under the impression that I may have some learning deficiencies in school and that I may be um, challenged in very, mentally in very many ways and I wouldn't be able to keep up with the kids. I don't know if the doctors officially told that. I'm guessing that's what they did. So my dad put me through a training regime when I was very, very young. And what he would do is he would give me a piece of paper and he'd give me 10 very simple math problems. Two plus two, three plus four, blah, 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 blah. He'd say, Ryan, if you solve all of these, I'm going to take you to the gas station and buy you a candy bar. And by God, when you are a little kid, you'll do anything for a candy bar. So I'd quickly do the little math. I'd show him the answers. And he'd be like, no, 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 no. You missed this one. Try again. Okay, okay. I give it to him again. Okay, that's right. He'd take me to the gas station and I'd get my candy bar. He wouldn't do this every day and he wouldn't let me get a candy bar every day. Sometimes he'd let me get a juice or a popsicle or something. He, he had a very good way of enticing me to do it. Um, but he would constantly make it harder. So first it was addition, and then it was addition of two-digit numbers, and then it was subtraction, and then it was multiplication, and then it was division, and then it was powers. And then my dad took away the paper, and my dad wouldn't let me give him the straight answer. I had to tell him step by step by step how I was calculating it. So for example, if my dad said, Ryan, what's 13 squared? I would have to say it's 130 plus 30 plus 9, which is 169, for example. So he would teach me how to do it, then I'd have to do it on the paper, and then he'd take away the paper, and then he'd start to time me. And I thought this was just like a fun little game that I was playing with my dad. Um, but really, he was trying to train me for school so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be behind. So I remember the first day that I went to kindergarten and I was sitting there and my teacher, Mrs. Moss, she was an amazing teacher and an amazing lady. She said, okay, class, today we're going to learn how to count to 10. And I raised my hand and I said, Mrs. Moss, when do we learn what comes after division? She looked at me and said, fifth grade? And I was like, uh, what? So then um, they, they gave me a mentor. I had like special training in school. And I always liked school from then on. From my dad training me, um, I, I loved school all the time. I, I loved learning. I loved math. That's what I majored in in college. I majored in math. Um, but I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that I was smart. I think it has everything to do with the fact that I was trained. I had a very good dad. My mom taught me a lot of stuff too. My mom played with me a lot. She was very um, into getting me to read. And so uh, I was trained. It's not that I was smart. So when I was three and a half years old, we had a new challenger. I had my baby brother that was born, Lee. You might have seen Lee. Uh, he does a lot of editing for my YouTube. And also sometimes he fills in for me on the challenge drifts when I absolutely cannot make the video. So Lee will probably make this video, so shout out to Lee. Um, and having a baby brother made my life a lot better. I had a playmate. I had someone to play video games with and sports with. So uh, it, was, it was quite amazing. And uh, uh, for the most part, our entire lives, you know, we had, our, we had our rough patches, I guess, here and there. But we pretty much stayed pretty close our whole lives, which is, I guess, not something that all family members do. So... I got my brother Lee when I was three and a half. That, that was a big life moment for me. So going into hobbies, I had really only two hobbies. I liked to play sports. I loved to play soccer. Soccer was my sport. And I loved to play video games. Now let me tell you how I got into video games. When I was very little, couldn't even, couldn't even talk, didn't even know what the hell was going on, I would sit on my bed and I would watch my mom play Mario. My parents loved video games. They played it for fun. They really enjoyed it. So my mom had Mario. And I would just watch her and my mom would say that I was just 
fascinated. Like the attention that I would give to this screen, even though I clearly had no idea what was going on, was just way higher than any of my toys or anything else that I would do. And I remember there was one moment where it clicked in my brain where my mom was controlling this guy on this screen. She was controlling him with this controller she was holding. And once I figured that out, I said, Mom, give me that. Let me do it. And uh, man, I, I can still remember. I, it was just, it, I had so much enjoyment. I had so much fun controlling this like virtual person in this virtual world and jumping over things and crushing the mushrooms and trying to save the princess. Um, I just had an overflow of positive emotions and I just, I knew it was going to be one of my biggest passions. That along with sports, I played soccer with my dad. I played uh, baseball. I, I was a very fast runner, very fast. I was, uh, I loved to bike ride. Pretty much it's either outside playing sports, and when my dad was exhausted, I'd play video games. One of my fondest memories by far was we got Final Fantasy 1. And Final Fantasy 1, when I got that game, I thought it was just, I thought it was just the best thing that had ever happened to me. The problem is, is I couldn't read, and you have to, that game is so difficult, and you have to read, and I, I just couldn't figure it out. I just needed my dad's help. I was just too young. But... Um, my ability to grind was insane. So, you know, my dad would go away and I would just grind and kill wolves. You know, in that South Park episode, they just kill wolves. I just slaughter enemies endlessly, endlessly. My dad taught me how to heal myself at the inn. No problem. I learned how to cure myself. I learned how to use the items. I mean, it's essentially like if I had kids for Diablo 4, I just have them run bounties for me, right? My dad was just essentially having me farm him Final Fantasy 1 XP. And then when we got to the final boss, I remember we just absolutely crushed him because we were so overleveled. It was crazy. Um, but man, that was, that was su such good times playing those early games. And my parents, again, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm kind of losing my voice here. My parents not only liked video games, they thought video games were actually good for Lee and I to play in moderation because they viewed it as us solving problems. You know, if you get your ass kicked in Final Fantasy 1, you got to figure out, well, how are you going to not get your ass kicked in the same boss fight? And I, back then, video games were actually hard. Did you ever play Ninja Gaiden? Did you ever play the original Mega Man? Did you ever play the original Final Fantasy 1? Those games are hard. You have to actually, you know, solve, solve some problems there. And so they actually thought it was cognitive, cognitively good for us, especially for me. You know, they thought I was going to be a little bit behind um, but with all the training, that, that's not what happened. So then came a huge moment in my life called Jackpot. So uh, my uncle Roque, my uncle Roque was talking to my dad. And uh, he was very upset. They were talking about business, but my uncle was very upset that he couldn't figure out how to enter Castle 5 in Dark World in Zelda A Link to the Past. My grandpa had bought, bought me a Super Nintendo for my fourth or fifth birthday, and I had Zelda. I had beat the game. I loved that game. It was incredible. And uh, my dad told him, my, my uncle, he said, hey, my son beat Zelda A Link to the Past. You want to ask him how he, how he opened it? My uncle said, yes, put him on the phone. My uncle Rocky said, all right, Ryan. How do you enter Castle 5 in Dark World? Now, sorry if there's any a Link to the Past pros in here. I haven't played this game in a long time. But I think the way that you enter Castle 5 in Dark World is you go to that spot in Light World and you use the mirror, right? And then you're in uh, level 5. Is that right? Well, correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. I think, that, I think that's how it goes. Anyway, I told him how it works. Go to the spot in Light World, use the mirror, and then you're in, then you're in uh, level 5. He goes, all right, let me try that. I said, you're right. It worked. He said, Ryan, I'm going to send you a present. And I go, okay. And then I gave the phone back to my dad. Uh, a few weeks later, a, gig a gigantic box arrived. And my dad had the biggest smile on his face. And he goes, Ryan, you're not going to believe what Uncle Rocky sent you. And I opened up the box and inside was essentially every single video game system 
and just about every single video game for all the systems ever made to that point. He sent me all of them. So I had, I got nine systems in total. I see if I can rattle them all off here. It was a regular Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, a Sega, a Sega CD, a Game Gear, a Neo Geo, a Socrates, an Atari. And a Game Boy? Game Boy? That, was that them? That, I might have got them all. And so uh, we, had, we had everything now. We had Breath of Fire. Fin I got Final Fantasy 2 and 3 now, which is like 4 and 6 in Japanese. But uh, Cecil and Kane and fight Golbez at the end, or whatever his name is, and then Kefka, right? And then I got uh, Chrono Trigger. I got... Uh, yeah, you know, Breath of Fire. I got Top Gear. I got NBA Jam. I got Sonic. I got the X Men games. I got Final Fight, Double Dragon, anything. Uh, Secret of Mana, Illusion of Gaia, all of them. And so I had my little brother there, and I said, "Okay, ready to go? Here we go. We start plugging in game after game after game. We just start blasting." Play sports all day, go to school, and then come back and just start blast video games. So uh, I had the opportunity to, to play some of the greatest ones ever, and it was all thanks to my uncle Rocky for him uh, for helping him with that uh, Zelda question. So pretty much my life was was going great. I wasn't very sick anymore. I had my brother, I was playing sports, and my parents were still together. Um, I just won the, the video game jackpot. Life couldn't be better. Well, when life goes really good, the only place to go is down. Um, some really bad things happened to my family, which I'm probably just not going to get into. But um, uh, essentially, my, my grandma died, my parents divorced, and my dad moved away. Just put it that way. Grandma died. I was, as the grandparent, I was the closest to. Um, so that, that really, it really bothered me and it really bothered my mom. Parents are gone and my, my dad's gone. So it's just me, uh, my mom, and my brother. And uh, in some ways, this was good for me uh, because. Other than my rough start, everything had gone so well. By this time, I was about 11. It was actually very good for me to get a taste of what happens when life goes very, very badly at a young age. I'm, I'm grateful for it. Because uh, I, I essentially had to think about, you know, what was going to be my path forward here. So then I made a vow to myself. I was talking to my mom. And she was saying, you know, we, we, were, we, weren't in, we weren't in a good financial condition at all at the time. She's saying, Ryan, uh, you can go to college if you do very well in school. You always have done well in school. But if you dominate middle school and high school, you can get a scholarship. You can crush the ACT. And uh, you can go for free. All you have to do is be a good student. And I just... I just instantly vowed to myself, I said, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get a degree, and it's going to be free. I'm going to get it for free, and I'm just going to crush school. I already like school, so it's not like a, a huge difference from what I've been doing, but I, you know, I'm essentially going to try to really prove myself in the education system when it comes time for the ACT or the SAT. I'm going to absolutely crush them, and uh, I would love to be the first person on Mars. Um, even if it's a one-way ticket, that's fine. That's what I really wanted to do. Part of this downfall section that I didn't mention is my uh, eardrum. Remember, my ear was so bad from when I was beginning. It ruptured in, in, a, in a significant way, and uh, I had to have a tympanoplasty. So they shaved off this hair behind my ear. They cut off part of my scalp. They ripped out my eardrum, and they sewed me a new one. Um, the reason why that's significant is I could no longer be the first person on Mars. I'm pretty sure if I get on a spaceship and take off, the G-force is just going to rip my, my ear straight out of my head. It's just going to make my ear explode. So that was gone. So my vow was I was going to study very hard and get into aeronautics and go work for NASA. That's what I really wanted to do. 
So we moved around. It's just me and my mom and my brother now. And now came a, what I would call like a new era for me. I moved schools. I made a bunch of new friends, a lot of lifelong friends. There was Jeff, there was Corey, there was Josh, there was Aaron, there was David, and then more along the way. Later, I met Kirk and Josh and Marshall. But I met almost all of my friends through video games, and we played Final Fantasy VII. I thought that was just the absolute godliest game I'd ever played. I'd played, remember, I'd played all the good ones. I had played the Zeldas, the, the Final Fantasies 1, 2, and 3. I'd played Chrono Trigger. I played some of the best games ever made. But when Final Fantasy VII came out, that game was just... I still think it's the greatest game ever made. Um, there was GoldenEye. There was Perfect Dark. And then I had a, a huge, huge infatuation with Halo. I'll get to that in a second. Heroes of Might and Magic. You guys ever played Heroes of Might and Magic 2 and Heroes of Might and Magic 3, Armageddon's Blade, and Shadow of Death? Oh, can't tell you how many hours I spent playing that game. Loved it. Um, Diablo 2, uh, Zelda, obviously all the different Zeldas. Diablo 2 for me, I remember my friend, remember my friend Corey, he bought the game. He said, I just got a game called Diablo 2. I sat down and I started playing it. I was going through, I was going through Act 2 and I remember um, just killing monsters, gaining XP, building up my character, finding items and just getting stronger. It, it was just a little bit different. It was just like my first real taste of like an ARPG. And I don't know why, I was just so hooked on that. Like, I'd played so many other fantastic games. Another godly one I need to put on here is Twisted Metal 2. You guys ever played that with Minion and Sweet Tooth? God, that was a godly game. Just played so many hours of that. Um, but Diablo 2, for me, was just, just an absolute masterpiece. A little bit before then, I'll tell you a funny story about Pokemon. So when I went to my new school, uh, my friend David was holding some cards. I said, what are those? He said, they're Pokemon cards. I go, what do you do? Like collect them or something? He goes, no, there's a card game and they have tournaments at the mall every week. And if you win, you can win like a hundred bucks. It only costs $2 to enter. I go, why don't we enter and win? He goes, well, there's a lot of people that go. I mean, you got to beat like a hundred people. I go, okay, let's just win. No problem. Um, so I, he goes, take my cards and go try to win. He just had a basic starter deck. I went to the first tournament. I paid two bucks. I got destroyed. I read the rule book and I stayed. Whenever every, anybody would lose, they would just leave the tournament. I didn't, I didn't leave. I stayed and I watched. I watched all the people. I watched the top eight, top four, and the finals. And I was studying. What are they doing and why? What cards do they have and why? Then I went to a, a place called Hobby Town. Hobby Town had a magazine called Scry, where Scry had deck ideas, strategies, and it had a copy of all the cards. I spent, you know, the four dollars that I had to my name on the magazine or whatever, and I sat there in Hobby Town studying the cards and studying this magazine. I asked my mom, "Mom, can you give me like twenty bucks? I'm going to buy some cards. I'm going to go to a tournament. I'm going to try to make more than twenty bucks." My mom was like, "Okay, sure," which was very nice of her because, you know, we I don't think we were. We weren't, swimming, we weren't swimming in money or anything, but that was very nice of her. And she gave me enough to ride my bike back to Hobby Town. And I very strategically bought specific cards, energy removal, gust of wind, computer search, a lot of the cheaper. Luckily for me, a lot of the cheap basic Pokemon cards were actually some of the best ones in the game. I made a deck and I, I entered the, the tournament again and I got like third with the deck that I made after studying and studying and buying my own cards. So with the third, with third place, I made like 20 bucks. I immediately reinvested it. I bought the remaining cards that I needed. I needed a Scyther, I needed a Chansey, I needed some scoop ups, et cetera. You know, you start with Chansey out, you let, even if they start him and Chan, you jab, jab, you scoop him up. It's got 80 damage counters, you throw it off, or you start with Scyther and retreat him. Then the movie came out, movie Mewtwo, computer search two psychic energy, psychic energy on the Mewtwo. Computer search for the oak, oak your hand, load up your bench. Then you, uh, whatever the, what was that ability called where you pull the two psychics out of your discard pile. Now you have a fully pumped Mewtwo, energy removal their entire team. Then you just pump up like a Hitman Chan in case they have like a Jigglypuff or something. And then you just win. 
So then I went the next week and I won. And then I went the next week and I won and I won and I won. I started to win and I started to, uh, at least for a little seventh grade kid, I used to dominate. And uh, I actually got a phone call um, from Wizards of the Coast inviting me to go to Nationals and Worlds to play for the United States because um, the Wizards of the Coast had a DCI number that you entered in in all the computer tournaments. And they said, do you want to come play for the United States in Pokemon? And uh, right before they called me, all of my cards had gotten stolen and I was kind of getting out of it. And I told them, uh, l l let me talk it over with my mom. And I go, and they said, your mom can come. It's, it, someone can come with you. And I was like, mom, do you think I should go? And my mom said, there's only, one, there's only one thing you need to do to decide this, Ryan. Do you want to go? And I go, not really. I don't really play anymore. And I honestly don't really want to win because I thought I would be the laughing stock of my school. Oh, Ryan from Nebraska is actually, actually Ash Ketchum, and he's the pokey master. Then so some people will ask me, Ryan, why didn't you go and lose on purpose? And I go, have you ever met me? If I go, I, there's no way I'm just going to throw. I'm going to try to win if I go. Anyway, they were very surprised, but I told them I don't want to go. So I never, I never actually went to the Nationals or the Worlds. In hindsight, of course, now that I'm grown up and I don't give a crap, I should have went. I should have went and kicked everybody's ass. But the thing that I never understood is everyone's using the same Haymaker deck. I never really understood why... I, I don't know. I guess I just got lucky and kept outdrawing people, but I don't know why... That strategy works so well. I just kept doing the same thing every tournament and nobody really had an answer for it. Maybe it would have been dis different in nationals and worlds, but I, I certainly didn't have any opposition in these, in these uh, mall tournaments. Um, so yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of, again, these are like my middle school, high school years, spent a lot of time trying in school. I got my homework done, but then I just played, I played video games, I played sports. Again, I swam a lot. Once I have the tympanoplasty, then I can actually put my head underwater for the first time. So I could swim, played soccer, ran around, uh, played football with my friends. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a good safe neighborhood to grow up in, and I had a lot of lifelong friends and uh, no complaints at all. And uh, my mom gave us a, a, a nice place to grow up. She, she did a, a nice turnaround from how bad things were up here. Uh, so then need to, needed to think about what am I going to do for my future here? So, um, at the end of high school, um, things went very well. I had a 4.0 in high school. I had all the AP classes done. I got a 35 on the ACT, which is not a perfect score. I wanted the 36. I didn't get it, but that opened up all the doors for me. I got scholarship offers. I wanted to go work for NASA. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Mars, but I can't because of my ear. Um, and then the first call I got actually was from the University of Nebraska, where I grew up. And they said, Ryan, listen, we want you. Before any, you don't even have to apply. We want you to come to Nebraska and we're going to make you a deal. You, we'll, give you, we'll give you a full ride. Come to Nebraska. We only ask one thing. You need to major in engineering, whatever engineering discipline you want. You have a free ride. Don't even have to apply. <clears throat> so I asked them, do you have an aeronautics program? Nope. Okay. I wanted to stay in Nebraska. My friends were there. I didn't have a huge, I didn't have a uh, propensity to leave. I wanted to stay close to my mom, close to my brother, close to my friends. I like Nebraska. Grew up there pretty much my whole life. And uh, I actually... Kind of surprising to myself thinking about it now. I, did, I, just, I just took it. I, they didn't have an aeronautics program. And I thought maybe I can still work for NASA. Maybe if I study like engineering or something, computer engineering or electrical engineering, which is what I enrolled in. And I thought maybe I can still make that happen. So um, when I was studying electrical engineering and computer engineering, I could definitely do the course work. I did well in the classes. The problem is, is I just hated it. I hated sitting there coding. I hated sitting there, you know, trying to structurally engineer a bridge or solving circuits. 
I just found it very boring. The only thing that I liked doing was doing the really difficult math problems and the statistical problems. That's what I loved doing, or anything to do with astronomy. So I asked them, listen, um, I'm doing fine in your, in your engineering classes, but I, I don't want to be an engineer. Can I switch my scholarship and can I be a math major or a, or a statistician? And they said, no. If you drop it, you're out. So then I uh, have another inflection point, then started my career actually when I was walking away from that meeting with the advisor. And there was a little booth there for Nationwide Insurance, and they were sitting there, and they said, hey, you. I go, yeah. They go, are you looking for a job? And I go, no, I'm, I'm in school. And they go, why don't you get a job at Nationwide? I go, I, I just told you, I'm trying to, trying to do my school stuff over here. And they said, listen, you should come work for us, and we'll pay you a decent wage. You'll have benefits, and here's the best part. After one year, we'll pay your tuition. And I go, okay, hold on, wait a minute. You'll pay my tuition no matter what I study, whatever you want. I go, all right, I work for you for a year, and then I can go to school full-time and get my math major. And they go, math major? That sounds great, yeah. We'll pay for that for sure. I go, okay, how do I apply? Went in for the interview, got hired. I started at the bottom. I was just a little processor changing phone numbers and addresses. Just wanted to work there for one year and then uh, get my math major for free because I didn't want to pay for it. Then I was going to move on. Um, so when I was a processor, I was changing phone numbers and addresses. A lot of my peers around me, would their computers would break. And when you'd call IT at a corporation, I'm sure a thousand of you have went, th have went through this, it takes a thousand years for them to actually fix your damn computer, right? So what they would do is they would ask me. They'd just send me a little message. They said, Ryan, my computer doesn't work. Can you come fix it? I'd walk over there, and I 99% of the time can just fix it. You can fix 90% of IT problems by just restarting it, right? So after that happened for a while, I got pulled into a um, um, room, and they said, hey, Ryan, we noticed that you're walking around fixing all the computers, but we have an IT department for that. So I thought I was in huge trouble, and they go, we love that you're just fixing everything. The IT department sucks. I go, yeah, they do. And they said, we'll make you a deal. You're literally a processor, but do you want to just come in and just sit around and just wait for somebody to say that their computer's broken because it literally happens every day and uh, just go fix it? How do, you, how do you feel about that? I go, that's way better than changing addresses and phone numbers. So I went from a processor to an IT guy unofficially. And then um, they were having some big projects and they needed someone to manage them. And they go, Ryan, do you want to manage these? And by the way, this whole time I was simultaneously going um, full time for my math major. So I was, I was just a machine. I was just doing so many different things. I was just working and schooling. And then I did a little bit of lifting and soccer, played uh, a ton of WoW. I forgot WoW here, by the way. WoW pretty much consumed my entire life. 22,000 hours in WoW. I forgot about that one. Um, how do you forget 22,000 hours of your life? Anyway, um, would wake up at the crack of dawn, work half of my shift, drive to the university, go to my classes, drive back to Nationwide, do half of my shift, drive home, get my stuff, go play soccer with Marshall, change clothes, go, go with Conrad to lift. We'd lift an hour and a half, come back, we, we would go to Qdoba because I won free food at Qdoba for two years. So we ate at Qdoba for al almost two straight years for free. Uh, that's another funny story. Um, then we come home, we'd play well. We'd arena, we'd raid. It was a good life, but it was a busy life. Didn't have time for really, really anything else. Went from processing to IT to the project management. And uh, then I got my math major. And I said, all right, guys, I got my math major. I'm going to start applying for jobs. I got a lot of job offers. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we've had you for years. We want to keep you. What if we send you to our main office and make you an underwriter? It's literally the best possible position we could offer you since the headquarters is not here. What if we offered you the best position? And I thought about it, and I talked to my mom about it. And I said, Mom, I have some better offers that actually use my math major, or I could stay with Nationwide 
who has been so kind to me for a long time. Should I stay with Nationwide or should I jump ship? And she goes, Ryan, I know exactly what you should do. You should do it at whatever you think you should do. That's what you should do. I go, okay. Um, I'm going to stay with Nationwide. You guys have been so nice to me. This would be, what, the third time you guys have promoted me? I'll go be an underwriter. So then I was an underwriter. I felt like I needed more things to do because I was so used to doing full-time school, full-time work so, so much. So then I started to, stud to take my, the CPCU exams, which is essentially a master's degree in insurance. Uh, there's eight exams that you have to pass. I started passing all of those. And then uh, after working as an underwriter for a few years, my manager came up to me and said, Ryan, I have good news for you. They are hiring actuaries in Iowa in the main office. You should go apply and be an actuary. I said, Ann, that's very nice of you, but do you know what an actuary is? An actuary is not a mathematician. I am not trained in actuarial sciences. I've never taken an actuarial exam. I'm not an actuary. They go, R Ryan, that's a loser attitude. Why don't you apply and see if they'll, and see if they'll, they'll hire you? Why not? You're, you have a math major. It's numbers. It doesn't matter. Like, All right, just to humor you, I'll apply, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I applied, and they hired me. So that was crazy. I never expected that to happen, but they hired me with no actuarial experience and no actuarial exams taken. When I got to the actuarial department, it was very, very difficult. Probably the, probably the moment in my life where I was challenged the most, like out of anything that I did, because, trying to be an actuary without actually having any formal actuarial training for like a Fortune 100 company was so hard. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to run the TBRs or the MARI reports or anything like that. Um, pretty much the only thing that made any sense to me was how to properly calculate like a rate level difference between an open and a closed company. That's about the only thing I could actually do. If I didn't have my trainer with me, I was just worthless. I was like, wow, this is just way harder than anything that I've done. I'm glad I didn't become an astronaut for NASA. I probably couldn't have done that either. Um, but over time, I, I hit my stride. I started to understand it. And then either the best or the worst thing happened to me, depending upon how you want to view it. All of the more senior actuaries above me got promoted and left. So by default, almost immediately, I became the senior actuary on the team. And I just got put on all the hardest projects and assignments. And uh, well, there's no better way to learn than to have to do you know, some of the hardest stuff, right? Um, but it made me much better. Um, I just hit, finally, eventually hit my stride. Finally, it clicked. And then they didn't have a formal trainer in the actuarial department. So then we were bringing in new people and the new people were like, what do we do? Like we're, we're clueless. And they asked me, they said, Ryan, will you train the new people? Will you get them on board? And this is probably the moment that this may be some of the first glimpses into like YouTubing where this was, I was responsible for teaching people a very complicated process, not to imply that Diablo three is complicated. But I was trying to take a very complicated process and I would remember all of the, keep in mind all of the training that I had from my dad teaching me, you know, 13 times 13 is 10 times 13, which is 130 plus 30, which is 10 times 3 plus 3 times 3 is 9 is 169. From him training me to Mrs. Moss training me to the, in, in kindergarten, to the mentors that I had to getting, get, taking all the AP classes, to trying to ace the ACT, to the math major and the engineering and the, um, the CPCU exams, and then learning to be an actuary without any experience. I, rem I tried to remember what teaching methods worked for me and what didn't to make my own style. And then I started to try to train I tried to train people without any formal training experience. I didn't have any education on teaching people, but I had so many experience in an education environment where I was receiving the training that I could explain it to people. And maybe another example is in WOW, I was a GM of a, of a top guild for a long time. I was training you know, the other 24 raiders all the time how to actually kill the damn boss. So maybe WOW plus this actuarial thing probably has something to do with a little bit of my teaching style in YouTube. 
But I found it very rewarding. I found it very rewarding to see the light bulb turn on and to watch them enjoy their job and finally get it. That was worth more than, you know, just about just about anything else. Um, so then I was an actuary for a while. And then my uncle, uh, my uncle Rocky again, remember, remember Uncle Rocky from Jackpot? He was uh, running for president 2016. He got like fourth in the Democratic primary. I don't know, you can Wikipedia it if you want. Um, I was helping him out because Iowa votes first. So he came to Iowa. I was, I was there with his kind of his campaign helping him out. And he said, Ryan, I need you to run my biochemical plant for me. I need you to quit your job. I go, Tio. Tio means uncle in Spanish. Tio Roque, listen, uh, I appreciate the offer, but I've worked at Nationwide for a long time. I'm going to stay here. Uh, I'm good. And he goes, I'll pay you this much. And I said, OK, I'll resign. I'll put in my two weeks tomorrow. And I did. So then I spent a year traveling the world with Uncle Roque. We went to London. We went to Wisconsin. We went to uh, went all over the United States. We went to Caserta, Italy. We went to Cortland, Alabama. We went to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, San Diego, California, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I despised traveling. I despised going everywhere and talking to everybody about this power plant, but I'm glad I did. It was a good experience. It was a fun time with my uncle. So after a year of that, I said, like, can I, can I just go back to Nationwide? Um, and I finally got into the highest department in Nationwide, the product department. Product is kind of like the top tier, the top department in an insurance company where you actually decide the products that you that you sell and you price it with the actuarial department and then you underwrite it with the underwriting department. Then you talk to claims on how you're going to do that. You talk to sales about how you're going to advertise it, et cetera. So I was very happy kind of to reach the top and then I guess the sky was the limit from there. So then um, mixed in here a little bit was a little bit of tragedy, unfortunately. Um, so in my... While a lot of this was happening, unfortunately, a lot of my family members were starting to pass away. Um, I've dealt with quite a bit of death in my life. Um, my, my grandma died here that I was very close to. Uh, one of my grandpas was already dead. And here, my other, my other grandma and my grandpa died. And then my, my, one of my favorite aunts and uncles both died. And then my dad died. So, you know, it was, uh, I had such a lethal dose of so many close people dying around me. It was just my mom and my brother. There are some other aunts and uncles that live in other states, sure. But, um, yeah, all four grandparents, my Aunt Wendy, my Uncle Sam, who I grew up with, and my Aunt Wendy was my, you know, was my favorite aunt. And, uh, she gave me a, a really one of the nicest guitars that I have. I should cover guitars here. I didn't cover guitars. I'll tell you that story in a second. Um, and then my dad died. When when you're when a, when a parent dies, that's that's a different that's a different magnitude of anything else that could happen to you. I'm sure. Unfortunately, some of you have probably experienced that. Um, maybe it's not as bad as maybe your child dying, but when you lose a parent. That shakes you a little bit differently than anything else. So I just got such a lethal dose of death, lethal dose of death. Is that some kind of like oxymoron? Um, in, in this period here that, I don't know, in some ways you, you set your priorities a little bit differently. You stop taking literally anything for granted. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just I guess it kind of just shapes you into who you are, I guess. Um, so uh, I'll tell you uh, what what I did about that. But real quickly before I forget, um, give me two seconds. Let me go grab a guitar and show you. I can show you how I started playing guitar, which is kind of fun. Give me one second. There's a guitar right here. Hopefully it's tuned. Probably isn't, but it doesn't matter. I'm so bad you wouldn't be able to tell anyway. So, um, I was sitting in Spanish class in high school, and I had a teacher named Senor Pierce. He was a godly teacher, and uh, 
close enough. Um, so he was a godly teacher, and he had a guitar in the back. And I, after school, I walked up to him, and I said, Senor Pierce, can you teach me how to play that? And he said, no. I, I only know three chords. And he goes, are you a musician? I go, no. I've never been in band. I've never been in music class. and Literally nothing. I don't know anything. But uh, show me how to play the guitar. And he goes, I only know three chords. I know E, D, and A. That's all I, can, that's all I know. And I go, okay, well, show me that showed me how to hold it, and I go, do you mind if I sit here and practice? He goes, no, go ahead, no, knock yourself out. Well, I think you regretted saying that, because I literally sat there for hours, and I was trying to play E. I was like... Trying to play D. Trying to play A. I was just just terrible just absolutely terrible and it was a it was a uh, steel string guitar so it was shredding my hands actually one day one of my fingers started bleeding but I kept practicing eventually I got a little bit better and then I kept practicing and then it's and I got much better and I'm like okay well what, what do I even do with this and then uh there were other kids in my high school who were much better who would sometimes walk by and watch me practicing and then they would teach me stuff like uh, someone taught me dust in the wind and so anyway uh, play any more guitar but the idea was is people just kept giving me a little bit more a little bit more teaching me this teaching me that teaching me this and then like like John Mayer has like some crazy like finger picking patterns um, and I would just learn from other students and that someone taught me how to read tabs then I could look up tabs so I've still never in my life had like an official music lesson, but I enjoyed playing and I enjoyed learning from other people who were better than me. And once again, kind of like the, the theme here of my life, kind of like going back into the recovery and training thing with my dad or, you know, farming Final Fantasy one for my dad or how many hours I would put into just mindlessly practicing chords the amount of hours i was willing to put into individual things to try to master them was usually a lot higher than everybody else so even if i wasn't naturally talented at anything which i don't even know if i am naturally talented at anything um you know like the effort i put into pokemon all the little kids when they lose they cry and they leave the tournament I'd sit down and watch the other people play and learn. Why did I lose? Then I would go read the magazines. What do the top people say in this magazine? And then I would read the cards and I'd read the rule books and I'd talk to the tournament directors. If, if you want, you can, be, I think, really think you can be good at just about anything if you are really determined to make it happen, right? So, um, at the tail end of this tragedy stuff, now I started to make a decision because now I was at like this inflection point in my life. I had my math major. I had my CPCU, so I had my master's degree. I was actually, I already enrolled in my next master's degree. I was going for my MBA, a third of the way done. I, had a, I have a 4.0 in it, so I'm, I'm even going for more. I've worked my way from processing to IT, to project management, to underwriting, to actuarial tour the world with my uncle for a little bit and now i'm in product like the top dog and i can just i can just sail to the top from there right but um i sat there and i was just thinking about okay well what do i really want to do what do i want to do here and uh i wanted to be an astronaut go to mars i can't do that my ear won't let me do that so then I said, okay, uh, one thing I would have loved to do is I was thinking about being a doctor or an air traffic controller. 
my whole family pretty much are doctors. Uh, my grandpa was a urologist. My other grandpa was a gynecologist. My uncle Ken was a podiatrist. Uh, my, my brother is, uh, he works in dentistry, and he was actually a faculty at UNMC um, for dentistry. Um, you get the idea. A lot of my aunts are nurses, etc. Most of my family is in medicine. My grandpa told me, don't go into medicine. Medicine is, you don't want to do that. So my, my family kind of steered me away from going to be a doctor. Um, I was going to be an air traffic controller, but then they shut down a lot of the towers, so I, I didn't do that. Um, wanted to be in the aeronautics program, but it looked very hard to apply into that just with just a mathematics degree. So I was sitting there, I was like, well, is that it? And do I just coast here until I'm done? And then I, the whole time, obviously, I had followed Twitch and YouTube, always. And I would, I would, always, I would always enjoy watching streamers, streamers in particular, because I always thought what a dream it would be to be a content creator. I don't care about the fame at all. I don't care about the money at all. That, that's not it. It's I love video games. Video games had been my favorite hobby when I was really sick and I finally got out of being sick and I was playing Final Fantasy I with my dad and then my, my uncle my uncle sent me everything here and then I, I spent my childhood playing Final Fantasy VII and Pokemon and Goldeneye and Perfect Dark and Halo 1. I went to so many tournaments for Halo, Heroes of Might and Magic and um, Zelda and Diablo and WoW and Twisted Metal 2 and there's a lot more games that I'm sure I'm forgetting. That was just my, it was just my favorite thing and I just wanted to share that passion so much. But I was like, why would I give up everything that I've done? I literally did everything to arrive here. I paved my own path. Why would I give that up? That up? But then, every, every day I'd go to the drinking fountain to fill up my water bottle, and I'd see someone that was working at Nationwide, and they'd say something like, Oh, Ryan, it's so nice to see you. You're so young. Oh, you have such an amazing career ahead of you. Man, if I could go back and if I could be your age, you know, I, I would have been a marine biologist. I'm just so passionate about animals, but, you know, I just kind of stuck with it, and then I got married and had kids, and it's okay. I, I, I can tough it out for another 10 years. I'm going to get my 401K and my IRA, and things are going to be fine, but... uh. Man, if I could go back and do it all again, I would have loved to be a marine biologist. Then you go back the next day, and someone else tells you the same thing with a different dream, and a different dream, and a different dream. And I thought, how viable is it to be a content creator? Don't almost all of them just fail? Like, I don't even care. I will literally give up everything that I have. That's fine. And I just need to make enough to survive. If I can pay the... If I can pay the internet bill and keep the lights on, I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm a, I'm a very simple, simple guy. I grew up in the Midwest. I don't, I don't need anything. <clears throat> so I started to think about it, and I was like, well, what would I stream? Well, I could stream WoW. WoW is probably the game I'm best at, either WoW or Halo 1. Are probably the games I'm best at. Final Fantasy is the game that I love the most. I could stream Diablo 3. I like Diablo 3. Nobody else seems to like Diablo 3, and Diablo 3 seems to be dead. But what am I going to be playing in four years or so? I'm going to be playing Diablo 4. Like, Diablo 2 owned my soul, and I already have thousands of hours in D3. And WoW is kind of like, it's kind of like set sail for me. I think I've done enough in WoW. Should I stream D3? I mean, I like the game. I feel like I'm a really good player, but I haven't played in a season or two. Let me, let me open up Twitch. Let me, see, let me see who's streaming this. And the number one guy on there was a guy named Bloodshed. And my first question is, first of all, who is Bloodshed? And where did all the streamers go? Where are the, 
Kriparians? Where is where are the Quins? Where is the Dat Modses? Where is the Lord Fluffies? Big Daddy Den was there. I recognized him. I recognized Riker. I was like, wow, the landscape has changed. I'm going to have to learn who this bloodshed guy is. I don't know him. I've, I've never heard of him. But this guy, is he's like the top dog now. That's its kind of cool. Uh, Leviathan was still there. Recognized him, of course. But most of them had left. And so I felt, I felt a little weird. I was like, hmm, I guess I, I, guess I don't know... I don't know D3 anymore like I used to. And then I started to think, okay, I'm really passionate about all. I just love all of these games. Again, what am I going to be playing in a few years? I'm going to be playing Diablo 4. So I guess it makes sense that I would start in D3. So I guess we go there. I thought about starting in PoE, and I played it a, a tiny bit. My brother gave me a fully decked out character. It, it was a good game, and I'm sure it's a lot better now than it was back then. But I was like, nah, I like Diablo. I played Diablo 2 my whole life. So I was like, could I be a Diablo streamer? And then I, I just, I literally, I just went for it. One day, I said, you want to know what? I don't even care if I completely fail. I don't care at all. I'm going to go for it. That's what I want to do. Since I can't go to Mars, I want to be a content creator for video games. It's my favorite thing ever. I'll never get tired of it. And that's what I'm going to do. So I started to ask a bunch of people that I knew that streamed, how, how should I be a streamer? I want to be a streamer, not a YouTuber. I want to be a streamer. I want to talk to people live. That's the most fun. And they said, the most important things for you is you have to be committed. You have to have a schedule that you stick to. And you have to actually be passionate about the game that you're playing. People will see right through a bunch of nonsense if you're not actually passionate about it. And things like that. So I said, okay, I need to make a schedule. How often should I stream? And they said, well... As much as, you, as much as you can. Being online is better than not being online. You just have to stick to your schedule. I go, do I have to stream every day? And they said, no, and you shouldn't. And there's no way you can. Stream like five days a week and see how that goes. I go, wait, wait, wait. I can't stream every day? Why not? Because nobody does that. Nobody streams every day. Believe me, as a streamer, you're going to get fatigued. You're going you're gonna to burn out. It's terrible streaming every day. Don't do that. I go, okay. I, I'm hearing what you're saying. And by the way, they all told me that. I said, what if I did? Let's say I did and I didn't get burnt out and I just loved it. Would streaming every day, in theory, be better than not streaming every day? I said, yes, it would be better in that case. I go, okay. And I go, all right. I'm going to be a streamer and I'm going to stream every day. And I got to think of something that's going to set me apart from everybody. Like, there, no one's going to watch me unless I win everything. I got to win everything. I got to win every challenge rift. I have to be first place in everything. Oh, yeah, but there's botting and turbo HUD in this game. I certainly can't do that as a content creator. I still have my original account. I've never been banned. I mean, I can't cheat, but how can I beat the cheaters? I, I literally can't win in this game. Is anybody going to watch me if I'm not in first place? I don't think so. I was like, damn, what do I do? I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm just going to go with it anyway. I'm going to do my best. I don't know. But I don't think anybody's going to watch me unless I'm in first. And then, so I was, I was going to my job every day. And then I was doing my MBA, my second master's degree that I was signed up for. And then I was trying to stream for two or three hours. No, more than that. Three or four hours a day. Started off with two viewers, my mom and my brother. Had nobody. Slowly trickled up to three and four and five. And I remember the first day that I streamed, I had an Under Armour blue hoodie on. I should have actually gotten the actual thing. It's over there somewhere. I had an Under Armour blue hoodie on, and I was about to hit start my first stream. I remember the day. It was March 13, 2019. It was a Wednesday. And uh, I was wearing this Under Armour blue hoodie, and my, I was about to hit start, and I looked at the webcam. I looked at the preview, and I was like, oh, my God, my hair is everywhere. I didn't even think about my hair. God, I don't want to comb my hair. What am I going to do? I go, oh my God, 
No one's going to watch me anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to put the hoodie up. Oh my God, I'm a genius. There we go. Did my stream. Nobody watched me. That's fine. Next day, again, I go to work. I go get my master. I go to my master's degree stuff. I come home and I have the Under Armour hoodie on again. I'm not wearing the hoodie. I'm wearing the hoodie over a shirt, right? It's kind of like my, it's like my coat almost. I sit down. I look. Oh yeah, I forgot. I'll just put the hoodie up again. I'll just, I'll just wear the hoodie for now until I can figure out when the hell I'm going to have the motivation to comb my hair. So after I did that, I did the same trick like three or four times, three or four days in a row. And someone, some random person had come to my stream on multiple days and they go, bro, are you going to wear that hoodie every damn day? And I go, no, of course not. I mean, like I could if you dared me, but I'm not going to. I'm just, just wearing it because I just got back from my class, you know? I was like, I guess I could wear it every day, but then in the summer it would be terrible. So I'm not going to do that. And I thought, should I do that? Wait a minute. Should I do that? Maybe I could do that. Maybe that could be like my thing. Is that, a, is that a thing? Do people do that? I don't know. And uh, so I did. And here, here I am, three, three, point, three and a half years later. I, it just became my thing. <laughs> That's literally all it was. Another thing on the very first day when I started is I said, all right, guys, anyone who comes in my channel, I want to tell you something. I'm going to stream every single day for 10 years, no matter what. But Rax, what if? No. But Rax, what if you die? No. But Rax, what if you get married? No. But Rax, what if you go on vacation? No. We're streaming every day for 10 years, no exceptions. I don't know if we'll make it. We're at, we're at three years and five months right now. But for three years and five months, I have not missed a single day yet. It was a really stupid commitment. I should have listened to the other people. Sometimes it drives you crazy. But we're trying to stream every day for 10 years for no other reason other than I said I would. I promised I would, and I'm sick of people making promises or saying they're going to do things when they don't do it. So if I said I'm streaming every day for 10 years, no matter how stupid that was, I'm going to try. We'll see if I can go another, you know, six and a half years. Now we finally come to the YouTube part. Never wanted to be a YouTuber, never thought of being a YouTuber. I wanted to be a streamer, right? So when I was streaming, People would ask me, Rax, that build you have is really awesome. You have a video for it? Give me the video. You have a guide for it? No. Uh, here, watch Leviathan's guide. Watch Bloodshed's guide here. Watch Riker's guide. It's pretty much the same thing. No, 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 Rax. I want to watch your guide. I go, guys, this guide is almost like pretty much the same thing as mine. I might change. Yeah, I'd change a few things, but. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. No, Rax, you're not listening. I want to watch a guide from you. You make a video. And I was like, I don't want to make a video. I don't know how to make a video. I don't have an editing software. I, but I kept getting asked. It's like, okay, I'm going to make a YouTube. I'll make a YouTube. I'm going to make some videos. And... Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, maybe you guys could tell me a little bit more, but for some reason, my YouTube, after I started to put a little bit of work into it, was more, seemed to be more popular than my stream. Now, I understand YouTube is just much bigger than Twitch. I understand that, of course, but it still seemed like my videos were, were received very well. I couldn't tell you why. I don't know what, what magic, what magic was there. In fact, I can tell you there was no magic. I just had a very simple approach that I had learned from my actuarial days, from training the new people, from a lot of it from remembering how people trained me. Maybe some of it was from being a WoW GM from so long. I just want to tell you the basic things that you want to do and why, and then show you some gameplay and explain to you the decisions that I'm making. Let them absorb that and apply it to their game. And uh, I, I have very low production value in my videos. 
don't do anything fancy. L look at this video right here. Or in paint, drawing, freehand. It looks terrible, right? Um, but I think in some ways, when I watch other YouTubers, I would prefer just a pure message than a bunch of production value. Not that some people who put all the effort in, it looks amazing. But I don't think that for me as a consumer, you have to do that for me to like it. I just need you to be like a real and honest person. And so uh, that's, that's the, the style, I guess, that we use here. But let, let's be honest, I just don't have the talent to, uh, I haven't taken the time to learn how to actually do uh, uh, a tremendous um, overlays and all, all, the fancy, all the fancy video production stuff. So um, since YouTube was going well, and to sit there and think about it, I'm like, you know, why? Like, why is, the, why is it working? But YouTube was making my stream a lot more popular. So many people were popping in saying, bro, I saw you on YouTube. You're the blue hoodie guy. Thanks for the guide, man. I put it together. It worked great. I was like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Good to have you here. I like, I like it that you're better. I like it that you're here better now because now I can talk to you. Um, but over time, I really started to like YouTube much, much more. Um, it was a way for me to gather my thoughts into like a cohesive way and have a, like a final product that I hope you guys can like internalize and again, use in your game and, and have fun. So uh, with all of that happening, then Maxroll was formed, got uh, recruited onto Maxroll as kind of one of the founding members. Um, that has been a pleasure to be a part of them. Uh, a part of their organization and all that stuff. And uh, we built Diablo 3, then we built Diab Diablo Mortal. I still don't regret it. Had a, learned a lot, had a lot of fun with the team. Then we took down DI, helped launch Diablo 2, helped la launch Lost Ark. Now we're about to launch PoE in a few days. Can't wait for that. There will be more projects, of course. We're going to do Diablo 4. Uh, made a lot of lifelong friends in Max Roll. Met a lot of godly content creators. And uh, yeah, I'm really not sure how this happened. But now we have this little thing from uh, YouTube here. I don't know if you can see that. And I've never seen this before. I, have, I guess I can imagine what it is, but I don't know what's in here. So let's see what we have. Uh, man, I, 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 never, I never thought this would happen. We have a, oh, they have a letter. Okay, let's read the letter. What does this say? Do you, I remember my first subscriber? Well, it was Marshall, he cheated. My 100th subscriber? Thousandth? Don't. I don't have a clue. On the 100th or the 1,000th. Chances are you do. YouTube's assuming way too much from me. We know you'll definitely remember your 100,000th subscriber. Is there a way to tell? Can we look up who's number one? And uh, I want to look that I'm going to look that up later. Your fans may have found you while searching the YouTube, learned about you through a friend, or maybe you showed up in a recommended video. No matter how they came to your channel, fans stayed and their numbers increased because of your unique voice. Is that it? Is it the voice, guys? And the excitement of being part of a growing community that you established. We are thrilled to see the development of your community and are proud to honor your impressive milestone of reaching 100,000 subscribers with the Silver Creator Reward. Congratulations. We know that you may have many more stories to share with your community. Nope, I just shared all of them with you. And we know that your fans can't wait for you to engage and amaze them even more with your commitment and your creativity. Keep creating, keep building. We can't wait to see what you'll do next, and we're here to support you along the way. And who knows, when you reach your millionth subscriber, we may just write you and ask, do you remember your 100,000th subscriber? Don't think I'll ever get to a million, guys. Never thought I would get to... I really thought I'd get to a thousand. I never thought I would be a YouTuber. But uh, much more now than before. I'm, uh, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, it's really, it really has nothing to do with me. It's really all about you guys. Huh. It's got to be one of the coolest things I ever did in my life. Look at this. Can you see it? 
What does this say? I don't even know. You guys read it before me. What does that say? Man. What a journey. That's one of the it's one of the coolest things we ever achieved. Thank you guys. Thanks for everything. I uh I really really enjoy being here with you guys. This is uh this is what I always wanted to do. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But it means a lot to me. Thank you, guys. It means a lot. I guess that's it. Um, I think I gave you guys most of the stories, but... Uh, don't think I'll ever reach a million. I don't, I don't even know if I. I don't even know if I want to hit a million. Um, I'm just trying to stay the same person, you know. I'm just a. I'm just a boy from Nebraska. Had a tough start. But uh, we got through it. Yeah, I really love you guys. Thank you. And I love video games. I still love them, even after streaming every day for three and a half years, even after making 700 videos. I still love video games, I always have. I knew it. When I was young, when my mom handed me that controller playing Mario, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I get to control that virtual guy and do crazy things on the screen. I know a lot of people think that People who play video games are losers and antisocial nerds and degenerates and ways to society. But, I mean, video games are pretty much how I got all my friends. And it's how I've had a lot of my fun. It's how I met you guys, so. I don't agree with that at all. Anyway, big moment for us guys. Thank you. I'm very happy to be a YouTuber now, way more than I was in the beginning. In the beginning, you couldn't even get me to make a YouTube video. They had to beg me. And it's not a diss at all at the other content creators, the other guys that are still blasting. You should watch their channels. You should support them. I like all of them. I don't have any animosity against them. I want them to succeed. I want them to get this. I want them to get the gold one. They can have the diamond one. They can have it before me. I don't care at all want the community to be strong, and I want everyone to get along and enjoy the games that we all love. Anyway, that's the 100k subscriber. Maybe I won't have to make another one of these, because the next time it would be a million, and uh, I don't think I'm going to get to a million, man. I don't even know if I want to. I like to just be a, a simple boy from Nebraska, but uh, this is something I'll cherish forever. Thank you, guys.